on today's Zoo View, we look at the giraffe, an animal that can grow to be as tall as a two-story building. But did you know that it has the same number of bones in its neck as you do? They're born, um, the female is standing, and she sort of spreads her leg and she drops to the youngster. Here at the zoo, the giraffes are used to having lots of people come to see them, but in the wild, they're really very shy. These graceful animals come from Africa, where they live on the huge open fields called savannas. Other than man, giraffes have few natural enemies. And any animal that tries to attack one has to be careful of getting kicked by the animal's sharp, powerful hooves. A giraffe's favorite food is the leaves and twigs of acacia trees, which they eat with the help of their strong tongue that can stretch out as far as their head is long. They have a huge voice box in their neck, but they almost never make any noise. Another interesting fact is that giraffes hardly ever sleep, often no more than half an hour each night, and sometimes not at all. Giraffes spend the morning and early evening looking for food, and then rest during the hottest part of the day. When they can find it, they take a little water now and then because they can go without drinking for many weeks. A grown-up human is only as tall as the top of a giraffe's leg. The giraffe can smell and hear things very well, but did you know that it can see better than any other animal in Africa? So why don't you come to the Metro Toronto Zoo and see the giraffe, the world's tallest animal? than a speeding bullet. Able to leap large objects in a single bound, it's... Bartman! Catch another episode of The Simpsons next. It's Motley here. I've got some zone terminology for you once again. Our word now is tunage. That's the music underneath all the games. Whether it be bad tunage or good tunage, it's tunage all the same. And it ain't got nothing to do with fish. Just when you figured the green-shelled sewer dwellers had been turned into turtle soup, they've bounced back bigger and by all reports better than ever before. As we all know, Tournament Fighters was a real dud on the Mega Drive. So the rumours that the Super Nintendo version can even be compared to the mighty Street Fighter 2 is a real shock to this player system. But it is only a rumour. Joining the luscious April O'Neil at the Turtle Fight Fest, the Zones rumour busters, Rod DeMartin and Nick Smith. The first thing you've got to know about this brilliant beat-em-up is that it'll rip the skin off your thumbs faster than a game of Street Fighter Turbo. It's about time the Turtles made their debut as a fighting game and surprisingly, this isn't too bad. Maybe you're thinking that a turtle game couldn't possibly be a cool addition to your game collection, but don't fear, this game is more than enough proof that it will test even the best players. The specials are easy to get out, so you've always got a huge range of moves you can pull out at any stage. But probably the best thing about Tournament Fighters is its special attack meter. It gives you an ultra special special move. It's a great idea. And if you can get the special attack out, the moves are totally murderous. I don't know, the game didn't grab me as being overly impressive. The graphics, yeah, yeah, they're meant to suit the cartoony style. However, its lasting appeal didn't stretch over a great deal of time. Although Tournament Fighters has some neat touches, it doesn't really offer anything new. Well, I'm off now to kick some shell. I'd rate it a 77. There are only two bummers about this game, and the first is the graphics. I hate them. They're too bright and they have no depth. The second is the collision detection, which can be a bit dodgy when you're doing a bit of close-range trashing. Apart from that, though, Tournament Fighters is wicked. It's heaps better than Mortal Kombat and nearly as good as Street Fighter Turbo. I think that Nick, 
doesn't know what he's talking about, and I give it 90. Infrareds are here, and they're out to get you, guys. These toys are excellent for just about everything, and I mean everything. Being cordless, of course, means you can move freely around the room and still play your fave games. No worries, right? But these new techs do chew up your battery bill and now we have a limited range before the sensors can't pick up the signal. So this limits your movement and the controller would go at any time of the play. Imagine, you're just about to kill Bison in SF2 and your controller cucks it. Not cool, dudes. So if you're tired of the cord always getting in the way, then infrareds are for you. But remember, it costs bucks, so it's better spent on games, really. PC owners have been enjoying the delights of flight sims since before Sonic or Mario were even a glint in their maker's eye. And when it comes to choppers, the Comanche series is arguably the best of the best. For the uninitiated, the Comanche was going to be the Yanks' super chopper. But in the real world, massive budget cuts have kept the big C grounded. Thankfully, the game keeps on getting bigger and better. Stuart Clark briefs us on the latest Comanche mission. Comanche is probably my favourite game in the whole world. And these over-the-edge mission discs do just what they're supposed to. They make the best even better. There's 40 brand new missions and four different campaigns to challenge you. And challenge you they will. And if you thought the Comanche graphics couldn't get any better, then you're in for a surprise. Because you'll be fighting in raging snowstorms, flying around amazing mesa formations, and even see your chopper's reflection ripple in the water of deep rivers. So if you've never played Comanche before, get out from under your rock and do so. Then take a look at these add-on discs. If this doesn't send you over the edge, nothing will. This I'd score at 93. So. For all the vibe on just what's happening in the wonderful world of gaming, at the Rock Face, it's Muttley. Cool, game heads, it's Muttley, back the front and vibing with the buzz. Let's travel stateside and check out the games that are doing big beers. On the Super Nintendo and the Genesis, Mortal Kombat is still all the rage, even after seven months. With MK2 on the way in, I guess the bosses from Temple will be kicking down the doors and just about everything else in 94. Sports games continue to dominate the American charts. On the Genesis, NFL Football 94 starring Joe Montana, Madden 94 and NHL Hockey are all the rage. While on Super Nintendo, it's Tecmo Super Bowl and the Stanley Cup Hockey picking up the points. Latest top 10 entries include Flashback, now on the Super Nintendo. It's a true mind warper with six wicked levels of classic animation and adventure. Sonic 3, the little blue screaming ball of fluff, was given a massive 10 out of 10 by the EGM review crew. And don't you hate that word, fair dinkum. Remember that very rare and extremely elusive white game gear? Well, a Pommy department store is trying to unload the diamond encrusted 18 karat gold game gear case for $120,000. Sure, I would have bought it to scope it out, but it didn't come with any games. Now that scum all white. Stand by for the lock on, the take home skirmish unit, perfect for safe full on war games. The difference between this and the messy paint unit is that the lock on gear shoots harmless infrared sensors, which are no worries at all. All you do is stick on your head mount sensor and blast away. Instant war, instant fun. I'll catch you later. And remember, I'm Muttley, and you're not. Here's another awesome NBA jam cheat. For all the would-be shacks that want to play big block defense, get your hands around this power-up defense. At the Tonight's Matchup screen, press the B button four times. That's four times. Then hold all three buttons down until you see the words power-up defense appear where your name was. Now, guys, it's time to block. You are now entering. We've had lots of and I'm Dave Schaefer. Welcome to Cake Weather's special program, Tornado. The video you've seen was taken near North Platte, Nebraska last year. And Dave, during the next half hour, you'll be seeing some more remarkable footage as we show you how and where tornadoes form. And we'll also be telling you how we use that information to try and predict where tornadoes are likely to strike and how you can protect yourself when they do. But we're sure you still have plenty of questions, so we plan to be back after tonight's Shocker game with another half hour devoted exclusively to your phone calls. For now, though, let's get started with a look at the basic requirements for a tornado. There are two things tornadoes have to have. Tornadoes just love this stuff, rising air. Warm and muggy air is best because it can rise like a rocket. The air in this storm is rising fast, but there's still no tornado. All that rising air still needs a deadly spin. The spin begins when the wind down low blows a different direction than the wind higher up.
that's when the rising air starts to twist. But that rising, twisting air doesn't happen just anywhere. There is a very specific part of a storm where those conditions exist and where tornadoes will form. And the tornado area underneath the rising, spinning air is home to some very strange clouds. Last year near Ray, Colorado and Emporia, Kansas, we investigated in person. Here's what we saw. Tornadoes usually form in the back of a storm. Here, that's the puffy part on the left. Underneath, there are plenty of nasty-looking clouds, and the worst you can find is a wall cloud. Here's one sucking up dust like the world's biggest vacuum. The worst wall clouds spin like this. Both of these spinning wall clouds are dangerous because if a tornado forms, one of these is where it usually starts. Sure enough, there, under the left-hand wall cloud, is a tornado. The lifespan of a tornado doesn't seem that long unless you're in its path, and then the monster seems to live forever. Well, tonight we'd like to give you what we hope will be your closest look at a tornado from the safest possible place, your television screen. Texas storm chaser Tim Marshall captured a tornado from birth to death. Meet the invisible tornado. This is how some tornadoes are born, on the ground and causing trouble long before assuming a more familiar form. Tornado on the ground here, 625. Tornado on the ground. Tornado is on the ground. Oh, no doubt about it, there it goes. Up a little bit. In much the same way as you see the clothes on an invisible man, you can see the dust on a tornado. And that helps solve the problem of learning about tornadoes without actually getting in one. We can watch the dust instead. What a tornado! What we learn first is that beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? And that some people keep their eyes on the road and nothing else. What we learn next is that tornadoes need both rising and sinking air. Watch the ripples on the tornado. Those on the right go up, as does the air in the tornado itself. But those on the left are going down. The clear air to the left of the tornado is sinking. Air going up next to air going down can generate a great deal of spin. Just as a pencil held between your hands spins if you move your hands in opposite directions. That final dose of spin may be what pulls the tornado out of the clouds and down to the ground. Look at how, how this thing goes on up. Like this. All the way on up. Up, 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 up. Now we can see the entire tornado, from the cloudy funnel aloft to the dust below. At the moment, it's remarkably well behaved, spinning harmlessly in an open field. We wish they were all like this. As the tornado ages, the sinking air begins to surround it, starting to push the shroud of dust down and away from the funnel. That's a sign that the tornado is entering the final stage of its existence. That's called the rope stage, where the funnel gets very thin and very contorted. It's still dangerous, but clearly won't last much longer. The ripples on both sides of the funnel are now going down as sinking air surrounds the tornado and cuts off its supply of rising air. It's a sort of hardening of the arteries of the tornado, and as the sinking air completes its fatal embrace, it pushes the dust away from the tornado on all sides, and the tornado enters its last seconds of life. Then, finally, it's over and all that remains is a dissipating cloud of dust. While tornadoes don't last very long, they can cause tremendous damage. It brings to mind the Wichita Falls tornado of 1979, 5,000 houses destroyed in 18 minutes. Well, they're powerful sources of damage, and of course they are deadly. There are some things you can do to protect yourself, even if you're far away from home. When we come back, we'll show you what to do if a twister hits while you're out shopping, and some other safety tips, too. But first, Mike Phelps of the Cake Weather Team has been researching the worst tornadoes in Kansas history. No one ever saw the most destructive and deadly tornado in Kansas history. It was kind of dark outside, and a lot of ruined sounds. 
It came without warning, like a thief in the night, taking lives, splitting up families, and demolishing almost every building in the small community 25 miles southeast of Wichita. I picked the boy up out of his crib bed, started as I got to the door, the house started going, so I dove back under the bed, protecting my boy. 83 of Udall's citizens lost their lives in the storm, and almost 300 were injured. There was no warning, but there was a tornado watch, and this probably saved some lives by making the townsfolk aware that tornadoes were possible. You're watching Tornado, a cake weather special program. After two years of development, we saw it coming. Mm -hmm. We saw it. It, it, it touched coming. the ground. We seen it when it getting low to the ground. That's when we took up the other half. Three years after Udall, on June 10, 1958, Kansas suffered another major tornado disaster when a twister tore through the town of El Dorado in northern Butler County. I don't know how it took me in the air with the, in the car, but there were some trees that were perhaps. Well, they were high as a house, beside the house there, and I broke one of them off up about eight or ten feet. The damage is just as impressive as that witnessed in Udall, but unlike Udall, this tornado struck in the light of late afternoon. Fifteen people died, but thanks to advanced warning and the sight of the storm coming, many of El Dorado's residents had time to find adequate shelter. As a result, only a handful of people were hurt. Well, that sound makes a chill go up your spine. I know it does me, even on Mondays when it's just practice. Of course, it does mean that there's a storm, a tornado on the ground in your area, and that it's time to take cover. But what do you do? Where do you go? Important questions to consider. Waiting until you hear the siren to answer these questions could be too late. Our school systems make sure our children know what to do when those sirens go off. A lot of time is spent teaching and drilling kids on what to do if a tornado comes. The truth is, we adults are more likely to be at risk than our children. Not many of us would even know where to go if the sirens go off while we're working or playing. Our primary concern, of course, is the safety of our customers and uh, the tenant, mall tenant employees. Fortunately for us, people like John Bates, operations director for Town East Shopping Center, do think about tornado safety, even if we don't. Major storm. And you say we're about 20 feet below the east side level. Corridors hidden behind the shops of Town East Lower Level are capable of providing shelter for at least 2,000 people. When we start with the tornado watch, uh, we immediately post someone on the roof and in the parking lot as spotters. And then the, uh, the rest of our employees receive their assignments and uh, are equipped with uh, two way radios in the event that we do go into tornado warning. So uh, as soon as we go into tornado warning, they uh, go to their posts at the entrances and uh, outside in the mall common area to direct customers to the shelter area. Though a great many malls, such as Town East, do have emergency plans, Kansas doesn't require businesses to provide shelters or even to tell employees or customers when a tornado warning has been issued. It is the responsibility of the person, wherever they go, wherever they work, to be familiar with the building and know where a safe area is. And if those areas aren't easily recognizable, ask someone. Most places have an information or customer service desk. They should be able to tell you. If you or someone you know has a business and would like more information on shelters or emergency planning, you can call Pat Glynn at Disaster Management Aid. He'll be happy to help you out. Disaster Management can be reached at 383-7546. And we'd like to help you make your severe weather plans. Here are some tips on what to do when you're at home or caught out in the open when a tornado strikes. At home, go to the basement. If your home doesn't have one, go to a closet or hallway in the center of the house. 
If you live in a mobile home, get out. Find better shelter. Getting caught out in the road can be a real problem. Don't try to outrun the tornado. Simply pull over and lie face down in a ditch away from the car. Tornadoes are dangerous, and making your plans now can help make sure you and your family will live to tell about the next tornado that hits. And, of course, none of this will do you any good unless you know when a tornado is going to be headed your way. That's right, and predicting the likelihood of tornadoes is getting more accurate all the time, something we're happy about. When we come back, the newest weapon in forecasting severe weather and some old standbys, plus a look at some folks who risk their lives to get more information on these deadly storms. The Indians said that Burnett's Mound on the southwest side of Topeka would protect it from tornadoes. On the evening of June 8, 1966, that myth was shattered. A massive tornado roared over Burnett's Mound and tore a path of death and destruction one half mile wide. 17 people died, more than 500 were injured, damage totaled $100 million. wasn't the best of times. Wichita had a brush with its own tornado disaster on September 3rd, 1965. I was here, but just before the storm hit, the lights went out for about two minutes. And then we started downstairs, and by the time we got downstairs, it hit. An instant before it hit, I was looking out the window and saw things swirling around. A large tornado, 1,200 feet wide, dropped unexpectedly from the clouds around 8 o'clock that evening, tearing up the neighborhood around 13th and Woodlawn. For a tornado never detected by National Weather Service radar, Wichitans were lucky. While more than 25 people were hurt, no one was killed. At the moment, figuring out where a tornado is likely to form isn't the same thing as predicting where a tornado will strike, but it's the only thing we can do right now. And we do that in a number of ways in the Cake Storm Center. We collect data from many sources, the National Weather Service, local area storm spotters, bless their hearts, satellites, and of course, radar. We use the National Weather Service radar as a backup to our own Doppler radar. All of this to try to identify severe weather areas. And of course, there is a new age approaching rapidly that could make much of this work faster and more accurate. It's called NEXRAD, Next Generation Radar. When comparing NEXRAD with a current radar system like ours, it's almost like talking about the differences between a Boeing 747 and the Wright Brothers' first airplane. Doppler radar systems grew up here at the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma. Today, this new kid on the block, NEXRAD, is literally growing up in the same neighborhood. NEXRAD is a joint effort by three government agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, represented by the National Weather Service, and the Department of Transportation, represented by the Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA. As the console where the, uh, where the operator sits down and actually works with the radar, so if you want to have a seat there, uh, we'll show you some of this Dr. Works. Ron Alberti, director of the program, and Colonel James uh, Wyman, agreed to show us NEXRAD and let us see firsthand what it will mean to you and me. The intent here is to design a very user-friendly system. It so sure looks like it. You don't have to sure. be a real rocket scientist to sit down and operate it. Uh, this this we, sure seems that, like it should be easy enough, <laughs> even <laughs> for <laughs> an old weather band to uh, work on. Generally speaking, the major difference between NEXRAD and the Doppler radar you're used to seeing at home is how much of a storm the radar will sample in the sweep of the dish. Most radars will sample at a bandwidth of three to five degrees. Now that's a lot of information, but the next rad radar takes a much smaller sampling, giving a more specific picture of what's happening in the storm. The major storms will be uh, resolvable probably out to a couple hundred kilometers, um, or about 125 nautical miles. And it has a lot of capability for detecting minor, small scale events, up to the radar especially small-scale event like a tornado or a really strong yes. area of, uh, of intense or, wind inside a thunderstorm. Yes. We should get more lead time on the storms than we're getting now. Yes, I think that's true. 
The lead time or advance warning is important. We don't know about most tornadoes until they hit. To give the most lead time possible and make the picture even clearer, 175 units will be deployed across the U.S. In Kansas, four radar facilities will be installed, one at Goodland, Dodge City, Topeka, and here in Wichita. Construction on the Wichita site will begin in June of 1991, and plans are that it will be operational by January 1992. The cost of each site is two and one quarter million dollars. While that sounds expensive, the entire project is less than the price of one B-2 stealth bomber, which has a sticker price of $535 million. It's hard to know what price to, play, to place on human life, but, but they will save lives. No, no question about that. Imagine, Dave, three government organizations combining to put 175 locations around the country, and they're all going to be operational within the next three to four years, and all of that for three quarters of the price of one B-2 bomber. Yes, and even harder to believe, considering three government agencies were involved working together, it works fine. Not only does it work and, and do what it was originally set up to do, they're learning new things just about every day what this radar will do. Yeah, the weather part of it and the complicated part of the whole thing works fine, but there are a few minor flaws, like the lack of an alarm clock to get us <laughs> up early in the morning when we need to get up, and one other thing. What is that? I'd love to have a little fold-out door with a copy maker in there. Oh, I thought us... they had one of those. Well, we'll have to put one in there. It probably costs about half the price of a B-2 as well. <laughs> In the meantime, we'll use everything we have to warn you how to get out of the way of a tornado when it comes down in your neck of the woods. But there are some people who go out of their way to actually get in the way of tornadoes. People like you. Not me. <laughs> I never do that. No, no, of course not. Well, there are a few more around, peculiar individuals who like severe weather and go after those severe storms, like our own Mike Phelps, who's in the Storm Center right now. Thanks a lot, Dave. Well, as you know, there's an old-fashioned but time-honored way to detect and learn about tornadoes. It depends on the fact that there are two types of people, those that wisely hide from tornadoes and a much smaller group, mainly meteorologists, who tell everyone else to hide from tornadoes but don't always practice what they preach. It's the story of storm chasing, which is mostly hour upon hour behind the wheel of a car, but as you'll see, there are moments of excitement. The 1990 storm chase season got off to an early start. Lifted index of minus six. That's about still. six degrees there. Rather unstable for January, isn't it? Nice tornado sounding. Severe thunderstorms developed rapidly in northwest Oklahoma around noon on January 16th, then moved quickly into south central Kansas. Uh, Windshear graph today. Oh, if we have unidirectional shear, maybe it'll split it. A quick analysis of our maps and Doppler radar indicated we should head south. No storm chaser wants to aimlessly wander the flatlands. The objective is to head off the storm just before all the right forces come together to form a tornado. The chase was short, covering only 100 miles, and it was rather uneventful with only some interesting clouds to look at. But oh, what a year 1989 was. You can see the stuff uh, of getting out the back window. Great looking stuff. The Cake Storm Chase team logged more than 18,000 miles storm chasing last year. Now, we do this partly for our own personal enjoyment, but mainly we do it to learn more about how severe weather develops and behaves once it gets going. We gain a wealth of knowledge from each storm chase, and we pass that knowledge on to you with more accurate severe weather forecasts. Now back to the Storm Chase Wizards, Dave and Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. We hope you enjoyed learning about tornadoes tonight, and if you'd like to learn more, we can help. You can write to us here at Cake TV 10 for our severe storm guide. Just send us a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll send you the guide. It contains the rules of tornado safety and a map you'll find handy to keep track of the storms the next time we have an outbreak of severe weather. And we'll also send you a list of books about tornadoes. Some like Severe and Unusual Weather and Tornado Watch number 211 are available at the Wichita State Library. Others like Storm and Early American Tornadoes can be found in the Hutchinson Library. 
To get the complete list of Tornado Books, send a self-addressed stamp envelope, write to Tornado Books, P.O. Box 10, Cake TV, Wichita, Kansas, 67201. That's Tornado Books, Cake TV, P.O. Box 10, Wichita, Kansas, 67201. Dave and I thank you for watching, and I hope all the nice people out there join us for the question and answer program at the end of the Shocker game. Well, it's only fair they've been watching us for a half an hour. <laughs> I can get a half an hour after the game to give us some return treatment. Questions, grill us if you can. See us then. You know, they've said for years that tornadoes won't touch down down here because we're right between the rivers. See it picking the water up? See yeah. it moving down there? There's like two of them in there or something. It come down right on top of us. It, uh, there was no warning to when it was going to hit. It just come right down, and there she was. No warning at all. Picked that combine up, took it way down there, and put it in the slough. Them winds just do things that you don't even realize. Like I said, when I came around the corner and I was right in the middle of it, I just thought, oh, dear Lord, if you're going to take me now, I just hope and pray somebody finds me under all of this. When it hit the house, it was just a huge explosion, and uh, debris just went up into the air, and... Uh, Hey, Chuck, where do we want to go to find you when it gets done carrying you away? That, that, is, that is a tornado there. They tear through town in tattoos and leather. They're all strong, they're all great. But would you bring this man home to meet Mother? They are my family. They will always be my family. Now, a biker will tell you exactly how he feels. When you're in a car, it's like being in a fish tank. Oh, I've been a go-go dancer. I've been a uh, cheesecake model. Biker chicks. I have a corsage that never leaves me. On the next Geraldo. Wednesday morning at 9. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Superstars of Wrestling, joining us, the man who could very well be World Wrestling Federation champion, the British Bulldog. And then from there, Bo and Blake, the Beverly Brothers. And also in action will be none other than Rowdy Roddy Piper, and perhaps his dream coming closer and closer. And a special interview with the Macho Man Randy Savage and Elizabeth. of video discs was received with much ballyhoo on the part of producers in recent years and with very little acceptance on the part of the consumer. Now there is new hope for success. Leonard Malton has that story. King Kong has good reason to be upset. In the more than 50 years since his film was made, many prints and even negatives have become badly worn and damaged. The old ape could do nothing more than stand by and swallow it. But this print is in remarkable shape, and there's a reason for that. Thanks to a Los Angeles-based company called Criterion, King Kong of the 30s has found his way onto Laserdisc of the 80s. A laser actually reads the signal electronically. There is no deterioration. No matter how many times you use it, the, the disc itself can be handled. It's virtually indestructible, and the image remains as good as it was the day you bought it for innumerable uses. King Kong on disc was recorded from the original film negative in the Library of Congress. Criterion has also put Citizen Kane on disc and hopes to add more titles to the library. Beyond the advantages of picture quality and durability, Laserdisc also gives the serious film student instant access to any scene, to study frame by frame if he wants with perfect clarity. I suppose I want to go back and re-watch that scene. There you are. You've, you've done it in, in a flash. Once people get the controls in their hands, they sit there and they see, for instance, special effects in King Kong. Uh, you see how a film is made. Other parts of the Criterion package are a special audio channel for King Kong with background commentary from film scholar Ron Haver. Now watch very carefully when Kong 
picks up a ray. And visual essays following each film, which describe how they were made. It's a lot of information packed into it, and it's fascinating. It's a whole new departure in studying film, I think. This video disc library may be the greatest boon yet to film buffs. A perfect marriage of Hollywood's oldest treasures and the video world's newest technology. I'm Leonard Malton, Entertainment Tonight. Super Mario Kart Funny Car Madness! Only on Super NES! Turn the track into a giant mud pit! Or burn rubber on ice, wood, or asphalt! Fly Mix it up for the big boys! See Bowser and his big foot dropping truck! See Yoshi's go kart really go! Mushrooms, banana peels, turtle shell! Dino Might! Check your rear view and make a mean test! Or go into battle mode and ruin his day! Two speeds! Fast and way too fast! It's two player fun on the split screen! Only for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System! Now when you're playing with power, Super Power! May I have your attention, please? We birds are sick and tired of being chased around by uncivilized felines. So, take whatever you're feeding your cat and throw it away in the dumpster. Instead, try New Recipe Whiskers. It's made with USDA-approved beef and other top-notch ingredients, which cats like even better than small, colorful birds. You see how well that works? Thank you. Cats love the real meat taste of Whiskers. Cats would buy Whiskers. Welcome back to Gladiator Arena and our final event. The Eliminator will determine who advances to the next round. The women will start things off, and so far it has been all Shannon Williams. Just a shade over five feet, she has stood tall. She has amassed a 26-point lead over Kathy Marshall of Uniondale, New York, meaning Kathy will have to overcome a 13-second deficit in head start time. And right now, Kathy's with Larry at the start line. Larry? Kathy, 13 seconds is a pretty big hurdle to overcome. Can you do it? Um, I think I have a good chance. I'll do my best. You're I've, yeah, I've been doing my best all night, so I'll see how it goes. I'm sure your best will be good enough. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Well, 13 seconds could amount to a huge amount of real estate to make up the way Shannon Williams has been going. The world-class freestyle wrestler has been gangbusters so far through seven events. But this is it, and anything can happen here. Underneath the hand bike, ready to impose a 10-second penalty if need be, our Gladiator Siren and Electra, and activating the gauntlet. There it is. Boy, this thing can be tough to get through. It'll be Diamond and Storm. And the Eliminator is brought to you by Mars. Mars, making life a little sweeter. Propelling all of her 115 pounds up that reverse treadmill and now the hand bike. The contenders really have to use their legs as much as their arms to get across, and Shannon has done just that. Here comes Kathy. Across that spinning cylinder goes Shannon Williams, and now the cargo net. Kathy Marshall needs Shannon to make some kind of mistake. Now she's at the cargo net just as Shannon reaches the upper platform and now the zip line. The breezy ride into the mats below and then a final straightaway. And it looks like the little one, should she get over this wall, she decides to use that rope. From Susanville, California, Shannon Williams through the gauntlet. Here comes Kathy, but it's going to be Shannon Williams who advances to the next round. And as always, with a big, big smile on her face. Was there ever any doubt in your mind all day through the competition that you were going to do anything but win? Yeah, I, I was having a great day all day. And after the maze, I started getting down, thinking, oh, God. <laughs> but uh, then things started picking back up for me again. I feel, I feel great. Hard to believe that you were ever down. You've been smiling all day and full of enthusiasm. Yeah, you know, I, I thought today, I said, got to give everything my best shot and just have a, have a good time. Your best shot was good enough. Congratulations, gal, and welcome to the next round. Mike? Larry, a memorable performance by Shannon Williams. She punctuated every single event with an ear-to-ear -ear grin, and she congratulates the woman she beat, Kathy Marshall. The men are waiting in the wings, and our former University of Missouri football star Ted LePage has a 22-point lead, good for an 11-second head start on Roger Hughes. Roger has been silent since the very first event, Powerball. So this is the time, certainly, for him to make some kind of statement. It's that, or it's a long trip back home to Texas. 
Roger, not many points since Powerball. I know you're ready. If Ted makes one mistake, you're going to explode, aren't you? That's the truth. It's been like a bad day at work when nothing goes right. But I've got a chance to make everything up right here in one mistake, and this baby's all mine. This is why I make up for everything I did wrong today right here. Good luck. Thank you. All right. False bravado on the part of Roger? Not really. We have seen bigger deficits overcome in the past. On the course for the Gladiators underneath that hand bike. It'll be Cyclone in tower and activating the gauntlet down the final straightaway will be Viper and Turbo. Ready. One man will advance. Ted scrambles his way up that reverse treadmill. Now really smoking that hand bike. Here comes Roger Hughes, his last chance. Second time's the charm, but Ted already on the cargo net. Roger told Larry he's hoping that Ted will make some kind of mistake. He's gone through the three most perilous parts of the eliminator, so not much of a chance for that. Ted LePage looking mighty strong. He's seen these gauntlets before as blocking dummies in football practice. Ted LePage is going to bust across that finish line and advance to the next round. Ted, I know you had your concerns about a couple of events, but, Mister, you've done, you've lived up to every expectation. Well, it's been tough. I, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on you out here. Glad he's turned it up a notch. They, uh, they showed a lot more now than they did in practice. So I'm just glad to be part of this. Hey, Mom and Dad. Hey, Dave, Donnie, and Paul. Thanks for training me. Good job. Thank you. Welcome to the next round of the competition. Thank you very much. Well, congratulate Roger, too. You did a heck of a job. You sure did. Mike? Oh, shucks. Ted LePage, the humble victor. And I love that Missouri twang. He moves on in our competition. And coming up next week, more exciting preliminary round action. Glad you could join us here at Gladiator Arena. See you next week, everyone.